Welcome everybody. This is the Qvert Community Meeting, August 11th, 2021. On our agenda, well, let, before we start with the agenda, is there anybody here new that would like to introduce themselves? I should probably introduce myself. Um, the uh, I'm Josh Perkis. Uh, I work for the Red Hat Open Source Program Office, um, and I've been helping out the Qvert project um, because um, it's time for Kubert to advance within the CNCF hierarchy from a sandbox project to an incubating project. Um, so I've been helping out uh, Stu and David and Chris um, before we want to leave um, in order to make that happen. Thanks, Josh, and welcome. Is there anybody else today that is new to the team? All right. Well, moving on to the uh, main agenda, the first topic is actually we're going to hear from Josh again, uh, talking or uh, proposing new governance. Hey there. So, um, as part of becoming a mature CNCF project. Um, one of the things that the CNCF wants to see us demonstrate is that um, the Kuvert project has its own independent existence um, and that um, it's independent of Red Hat, um, you know, since it started as a Red Hat project. Um, and uh, that we have um, plans, we have both, you know, leadership now and plans for leadership in the future. Um, which means adopting some form of formal governance. Um, we've had informal governance um, up until now, um, you know, with uh, Fabian and Roman and David and, and the other project founders um, leading the project. But that doesn't it doesn't offer a lot of direct opportunities for new people to move up into those leadership um, positions, um, which we absolutely want because nobody's, you know, necessarily going to work on Cooper forever. Um, and so we want to make sure that the project continues to have leaders, even as people move on to other things. Um, so as such, uh, at, um, Chris and Fabian and David's request, I drafted what's a um, sort of simple but complete governance for the project. The idea being that we have a number of people who are project leaders in various areas, the people who are approvers on Kuvert, Kuvert um, the people who are leaders of different areas, um, like the, the couple of SIGs that actually have their own, um, their own contributors, um, uh, certain code areas, et cetera. And that among those people, we have some people who actually want to lead the project, not just technically, but also as an organization. So both communicating with the CNCF, thinking about the future of the project, um, troubleshooting any social problems that come up, things like code of conduct violations, et cetera. And, um, and so that, because the CNCF uses this term, that group of people, that subset of, of our actual leaders who also want to deal with governance issues will become the maintainers. Um, and then that group will add people to itself um, as folks step up or leave. And beyond that, there's just a lot of detail to take care of the usual things of, you know, hey, you know, for example, how do we dismiss somebody if they've disappeared and aren't have not answered their email in a year? Um, so if you take a look at the draft PR there, it's there. Um, as far as I can tell, the one open question from comments is, um, 
we need to start out with an initial group of maintainers. Um, the current list that I have there is the list that the CNCF has. I've been told that it's kind of dated um, because um, it was uh, kind of our list of approvers for Kubert Kubert from a year and a half, two year, from two years ago, something like that. So we'll want to update that. Um, other than that, if there are additional questions, they should come up during this meeting. So questions. I definitely second the uh, the motion to review the list of maintainers because these are, yeah, uh, as you just said, uh, half this or 30% of this list are people that are not actively involved in Qbert on a day-to-day -day basis. So I guess a follow-on question to that as part of this is, uh, is there a procedure for us to communicate changes back to CNCF in, in terms of like, how do we keep in sync what we think our maintainers are with what they think they are? Yeah. And that's one of the reasons to have formal governance because otherwise we never do this kind of review. <laughs> and, and, and then we actually need something from the CNCF and they say, well, you can't have that because you're not a maintainer. And they're going to be, well, none of these people are involved anymore. The, um, so the way to communicate it is um, we need to actually finalize this list in the PR, merge the PR, and then somebody who is recognized the CNCF by a maintainer, such as you, um, Stu, um, needs to communicate to them the new list, um, which, they, which you do by PR. You actually file a PR against the uh, CNCF slash foundation repo. So I, <clears throat> I've been looking through this document and I, I haven't made a lot of comments because I wasn't really sure what um, the next step is. And so it sounds like uh, if we agree on uh, just the general guidance here that this document provides, then the next step, correct me if I'm wrong, is we need to just create a initial seed list of maintainers that actually makes sense. And then we, we've kind of done it, at least we've mm -hmm. created. Uh, as a follow-up to this, it sounds like there needs to be regular meetings of some sort. Like, uh, what do we want to do with that? The, um, yeah, well, so one of the things, um, one of the things, first of all, is that you definitely, um, the, um, so there's both irregular and regular things. The irregular thing is, Believe it or not, you actually already have a maintainer mailing list that you're not using. Um, so you'll potentially want to start using that. Um, the main reasons to use that mailing list would be for, say, discussion discussions of promoting new maintainers and like things like COC violations and also um, security reports. Those will all get directed to the maintainer mailing list because it's a closed list. Um, uh, the um, and then you should decide whether or not you need to actually have separate maintainer meetings. I would say initially, except for things that require a closed meeting, um, that most maintainer discussion could happen at this meeting. Like, there's no reason why you actually need a separate meeting except for the times that you have to discuss things that you don't want to discuss in front of a group, like, for example, an unpatched security hole. Got it. Um, okay, so it's like an ad hoc sort of meeting. Yeah, well, and, and I would say generally for things like this to make sure that you keep on top of who's the current maintainer list, um, I, you know, I would say you probably should have a meeting for that, but like twice a year. Okay. Right, because like, cause like the current maintainer list is out of date, but it's out of date by like two years, right? It's not like this gets out of date within a month. Okay. This is really interesting. I didn't know that we had a mailing list for maintainers. What we actually have published somewhere in the community documentation uh, procedures for uh, applying to be a community member or you know to like how to do a maintainership. Yeah. Um, I guess as a flippant thought, we should make sure that what we're putting forth is a governance doc. Uh, is in agreement with what we said there. Not to say either, like, you know, we just need to make them, make sure they- Yeah, like, oh, the sort of the, the membership thing. Yes. And do, 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 let me actually look at that. Does that, that use the word maintainer? Doing. Sorry to talk over you, go ahead. Yeah, 
I mean, this is specifically one of the reasons we use the term maintainer because membership policy, which has the how do you advance from member to reviewer to approver, does not use the term maintainer. Right. And one of the things we specifically have outlined in that document, if I recall, was that we were using just a general CubeVert mailing list for uh, nominations for becoming a maintainer or an administrator of the project. I, it doesn't, that file does not mention being an administrator of the project. It's strictly oh. technical. It's code approver. Got it. Understood. Yeah. I was going to say, did I need to revise this? But I was actually looking at it and it does not need to be revised currently. It's just the, the steps in, in membership policy.md, which is the document we're talking about, are strictly technical advancement um, in terms of, you know, you have to review so many PRs, et cetera. Okay. So it's orthogonal. Uh, yeah, we've discussed yeah. that. That makes sense. Uh, so yeah. what do now, you need to move this whether forward? Go yeah, ahead. now whether or not, um, one of the things that's not really outlined there is, and, and you might want to add, is um, one of the things that's not really outlined in membership policy is, you know, how we, how we decide to advance people, particularly to approver, and you might decide later on that you want the maintainer group to do that because you know they're the ones who are actually have a mailing list in meetings, um, but then you might not. You might decide not to do that. You might decide that hey, you want to have the approvers of the individual repo do that, it, particularly if, for example, uh, say Sig Storage, um, you know, or a few other Sigs that might have their own sub repos spin off. Makes sense. So to move forward with this governance document, we need to come up with this list. Where do you propose that we have this discussion? Do you wanna just have it in the PR where we nominate people? Do you wanna have a separate meeting where a few of us get together? I'd like to have representation across multiple companies. So we'd need to, I have a few candidates in mind and things like that, but we need to kind of discuss it and then make a, maybe a reach out and see if they're interested before yeah. we just mark them down. Um, I imagine that this may be a two-step process, uh, David. We probably want to cull the list of uh, personnel that uh, you know, we would call them more of emeritus members of the uh, of the project at this point and not really actively contributing. And then, yes, absolutely, as step because otherwise, like you know. If, if you're going to look at the current group of, you know, maintainers and ask, you know, to have that increased, um, those existing members, by rights, we should be asking them their opinion on the matter. I don't think these people know that they're even. <laughs> I, I agree. I, and that's why I think it's a two step process, because they're not really involved at this point. Right, right. Uh, and what's the goal here, ultimately? Uh, we're trying to become a incubator project. So yeah. do, we need, do we need to have cross-company representation to help us get- It's not, it, right, it's not a requirement technically for incubating, um, but yeah, so um, four yeah, projects like, like Kubert that originated at a single company, it's a question that comes up. Um, so, so I like, wouldn't want to submit this unless we have multiple uh, companies involved. Yeah, and when, when I look at the, the last three other projects that got accepted to incubating, they all had some form of written governance um, at the time that they were accepted. Um, so, so the fact that we, even though it's not, even though it's not technically a requirement until you reach graduated level, um, we, we will stand out. Um, and then more importantly, part of the process of going from CNCF um, sandbox to incubated is you have a sponsor who is on the CNCF technical organizing committee. Um, and um, I, our sponsor, uh, Elena, has specifically asked about the governance. So, um, and, and the sponsor has sort of a lot of, of discretion because the way it generally works is 
once you convince the sponsor that you're ready to graduate, it's a, uh, it's the TOC then approves it. Um, so the hard part is convincing your sponsor. Um, the, um, I mean, there's also a second reason for this, right? Which is we have people who have joined the project since it started, who have been stepping up to do a lot of things. And um, there hasn't been really a formal way to allow those people to step all the way up to project leadership if they want to. Um, the, um, uh, which is the other reason to do this, the reason why it's a good idea and not just a CNCF requirement. Is there any guidance or precedent or notion of how many maintainers it is a good idea to have? I wouldn't necessarily say that there is, you know, I mean, obviously, if every contributor to the project is a maintainer, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, because not every contributor to the project is going to have time to think about the project, you know, and roadmap and, and all of the other things that you want at the maintainer level. Um, beyond that, I would say the list of people that we want to have as maintainer is really how likely are you to need this person's opinion when we're doing something major? If the answer is very likely, then they should probably be on the maintainers. Okay. Sorry, typing on mute. So um, is there any other thoughts on this? Have we? We got a bunch of people in the meetings. Anybody, uh, and it's been mostly me and Stu and David. Anyone else have thoughts, opinions, questions? Yes. I can just say, seems like, Roman here, seems like it makes sense what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> I agree on the general approach. Okay, so the general consensus is the big ticket item to readdress on the governance document is to review the maintainers. Um, and I agree with, I think somebody had mentioned earlier, potentially just making proposals or discussion right up directly on the PR. I think that's a good approach. Then it's up front and out, you know, public what we're up to. Okay, and then if, Josh, once this PR is then merged, is that, uh, we've then adopted that as our governance document in, in your mind, right? Yep, yes. We merged the PR and then um, you or um, someone else who is on the current CNCF list of maintainers um, uh, submits a PR to CNCF slash foundation um, that updates the list of maintainers there as well as notifies the CNCF staff that we have this governance document and that's where they should get their list of maintainers from. Um, the, um, um, and then it's a thing. Okay, I think we have a general idea what we need to do. Thank you so much for that. Welcome. Okay, so next topic, uh, Petr Horacek, you are looking to talk about outreach. -y. Yes, thanks. Um, so I'd like to enroll Covert as a project in the Outreach uh, internship program. Now for those of you who don't know, Outreach is a program for interns from underrepresented groups in uh, the industry. And I'm hoping that this could help us expose the project and also to get uh, some new people involved uh, in developing it. So I think I have one mentor already uh, ready, but uh, we will need two of them. So I'm looking for volunteers in this form. Now, what this would uh, require from you is five to 10 hours of your time uh, a week for circa four months, I believe, and to prepare a project for the intern to work on uh, something that's 
can be done in a half-time or part-time job for three months and interesting on Kubert. Um, so yeah, if you feel like you would be uh, interested in this, uh, hit me up. I would be happy to go with you through the details and to see if we can pull this off. Okay, well, uh, not everybody all at once. Um, but seriously, this is a great opportunity uh, for just helping out with the community, uh, for sharing your knowledge with somebody. Uh, so if you're interested, please reach out to Petr. Next up, Roman, you have, uh, I think we've talked about this before, but uh, CentOS 8 stream revisiting this. Yeah, um, I'm not sure when we talked about this the last time. Um, I think we mostly talked about it regarding to that CI already uses it, but um, uh, Andrea, from, a liberal engineer, is preparing a switch for, for our project to send a stream as the base image for all our images for some time, and it's pretty close now. Uh, I just basically wanted to give a heads up, and we also read about this on the mailing list. Um, I think it's beneficial for the project to go to center stream here because we can very easily get uh, up-to-date delivered and QEMU changes without having to rely on Fedora or Copper Fedora repos. But in case you have any concerns, happy if you bring them up here or late on the mailing list. I do have a question. Um, yeah. We're back to the reference of when we talked about this before. I want to say it was a year ago maybe and and at the time when we were starting to approach this we realized that there was an issue with machine types changing and it was going to disrupt migrations and that caused us to pause and reassess this move um, and so i just like to re-ask that question in case I, i'm sure we've thought about it and that the answer is not a problem but just to, to repeat what i think the problem was a year ago no, I can just say that all machine type related tests are passing. <laughs> Which is weird, isn't it? I, don't I, know. I have a question. We, we talk about the images of each, uh, each port or uh, only the VMs? Um, we talk about the images for Vert Handler and Vert Lundra. Okay. Um, and yeah, they're used right now for the as a base, but, uh, as some of you know, to get, uh, get Libert and human versions, which you want, Libert is providing to us some copper repos, which they're extra maintaining for us. And, but they have now some CentOS 8 streams just for Libert and QEMO, and it's much more easier for them to provide us the things from there. And regarding to the machine types, um, I could not remember that we had issues back then. My suspicion would be that we have that in that in the streams from CentOS just for Humo and Libert, we get the same thing, the same settings like we got from Fedora. But maybe that's wrong. But a good point. If I have to check something there, I'll check it. I think now uh, we're using Fedora, but uh, the machine types that we take, they are from um, from RHEL. I think this is the reason why it doesn't matter anymore. Because the, the machine types uh, in, in CentOS stream are, are pretty similar to what we currently have. Yeah, as far as I can tell, they look like they're the same. But... Yeah. Good, that's no, good. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that explains why the tests are passing. Great. I have, so, a, yeah. <laughs> I have a question here because it's, I mean, using CentOS stream to, re, to distribute something is a bit odd because if I'm not mistaken, the flow of, uh, I mean, CentOS 8 stream is an upstream of even Fedora. So it's like we are, it's very, very experimental in, in this sense. So it's like it's like we are uh, experimenting, putting something on an experimental uh, packages. Isn't well, it? Saint, I, mean, 
uh, maybe CentOS 9, the upcoming CentOS 9, maybe something experimental, for, but CentOS 8 stream is basically the upstream of RHEL. So it sits somewhere between Fedora and RHEL. So in the past, it was first going through Red Hat internal processes, and then it was at some point released somewhere, whatever we did. And then CentOS was assembled out of this. And now it's uh, the other way around. So for instance, uh, if, yeah, uh, if Red Hat engineers were cha are changing something, it goes first back upstream before it then goes to rel. But it's not upstream of Fedora, as far as I know. I, uh, yes, it's, I, I have this, I had, I had this, uh, I had this in this issue, or I don't know if it's an issue. I mean, I, I had work or was working with network manager as an example, and uh, and there the it it was it was odd when they when Rail started to releasing every six months because it caused uh, odd thing that on 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 Rail you could get uh, well, let's take about CentOS eight stream so you will get there uh, something that was worked on. Uh, very recently by <clears throat> by the developers on of Red Hat. and then it was not on Fedora because it was not uh, pushed there yet or was not released yet, yet there mm -hmm. and it it may have been already released in rel like when rel uh, is released let's say 84 or what whatever version something can land there and, and not be in Fedora for a few months, I don't know. Yeah, that is true. So F F CentOS 8 Stream is, uh, is, can have newer versions or, and also Rail can have newer versions nowadays compared to Fedora. That was not so common in the past, but can happen in the new model. So I had to just look up, Edward, just to see. Um, I believe in this case that uh, Roman is right that uh, CentOS Stream sits in between Fedora and RHEL according to their own documentation. It's, it's yes, it's like, I don't know, I mean, it's, I don't know how you define it well, but let's say usually you will have, you will have uh, versions landing first on CentOS Stream, then on, uh, on rel and then on fedora this is what happens today i guess in practice it's not I, a must but it's something that happens it's, it's something which can happen yes so yeah. we have a different uh, we have a different case also where uh where for c groups we too we need a change in container se linux and uh the C linux policy change will be first in center stream and rel because it, it's it's not a significant significant enough change to make it to Fedora before the next major release. Yeah. So, CentOS it's, Stream. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm I'm moving to another subject. So, if you have uh, any thoughts, please. So, with CentOS Stream, it's a rolling release. So, with, with uh, the images we were shipping in the past there was at least something relatively static that we could define as what the base image was. Um, because it would be whatever, you know, Fedora version we were on plus security patches as of that day would be what the, the, the image that we were building on is. With CentOS Stream, of course, everything is changing all the time because that's the point of a rolling release distro is that there's no such thing as eight or nine or whatever, it's just, rolling release. How, how are we going to uh, canonize what the bits are that we're going to be cooking when we build a, an image? That will continue like it did so far. Whatever is right now in our workspace file will, will be the release. Um, and updating of the dependencies will work like it did on Fedora before. There is a weekly job which just bumps all RPMs and tries to build with the latest it's there. Does that answer the question? I think I think you just describe what uh, that what will happen is that if you if you decide to update the image, then you will perform an update of the image, and then you will get all the updates until that time. That by, but I think what maybe what's still meant is that with Fedora, at least you have like uh, you have. You have fixed version, and you know some some of the things will not get in because 
they don't consider, they want to keep it a little bit stable. So in, the, in with central stream, you will not have this. So it's like, a, it's on you to make sure you don't uh, upgrade if you, uh, something that is not yet uh, fully stable. I, I think so, in general, yeah, that's a picture dollar here of what I mean, just so that it's clear. Uh, so at the beginning of this month, we released release 44. And at some point, we're probably going to have a patch release where we do a release 0.44.1 or 0.2. And according to what I just heard is whatever day we happen to uh, to build that image, we're going to get whatever the latest CentOS stream is for the base image. And that's fine, but next month we're going to release 0.45. And so what I'm hearing is that if we were to build uh, release 44.5, sometime in the middle of September, uh, it's actually going to have a newer uh, base image potentially than the one that we use for release 45.0. Uh, not, not, sure not right now because, not right now because right now we only update the RPMs on master. And so we've, we basically freeze our dependencies when we do it for, when we fork the release branch. And on master we update the RPMs weekly. Okay, great. Uh, that answers yeah, the question. I mean, we are sometimes updated it then because we had some CVEs and some, some RPMs, but yeah, it's not happening so often. Um, yeah, and regarding to Edward's comment, yes, um, since since it's a rolling release, there is probably potentially a chance for more breaking changes. On the other hand, uh, a CentOS 8 stream, a CentOS stream version X, like version 8, is supposed to be pretty stable too because it's part of the one rel 8. And for CentOS 9 stream, it will be rel 9. And uh, I suppose that very much a lot of breaking changes should not happen. I mean, yeah. I, I have no evidence yet to say that CentOS 8 stream is more buggy or less. It should be less buggy, but uh, it could also be the other case. Uh, but in general, one of the purposes for having it is to have fixes early for CentOS, which you had to wait sometimes in the past for a year or longer, or you had to live for it for the whole CentOS X lifecycle. Well, now you can get it fixed pretty fast. Well, the, the, the ability to get the fixes very fast is really a plus for this uh, to move to center stream. Yeah, I yeah. So. yeah. I mean, that, that whole reorg will then really streamline how we get stuff in. I mean, the, this is also, I think, to underline, it's a collaboration with the liver team, right? So there were many discussions over the past years, right, how we get fixes into into Qbert that the liver team or Qmu team did. And this required like custom copper repos and other stuff. And by moving to this new setup, that whole procedure to get stuff from the source into Qbert builds will be streamlined. So um, I think that's a great effort actually also by the, the liver team, kudos to them as well, besides you, Roman. And let me also add that, I don't know what, for instance, Ryan, uh is using as a base, or but I know that, for instance, uh, SUSE is using their own distribution as a base for Qbert that will for sure not change. You can still exchange the base with whatever you want. It's mostly about what we use for our releases and for end-to-end -end testing. Well, that was my, my next question was, <clears throat> do we have, like, I guess it's a kind of downstream. Do we, have, do we know if someone uses different, uh, Images that they build it on different uh, base op op OSs on, on some downstreams. Yeah, uh, and uh, definitely, uh, Suze does that definitely. They use it. They they use our Go build flow and use their Suze operating system as a base. Okay. Thanks. All right, any other questions on that front? 
I've seen a lot of uh, chat discussion uh, on the site. I haven't read it because uh, I was participating in the current discussion. Is there anything that needs to be brought back to the main forum there? It was all off the bike, I think. I think. Okay, thank you. All right, well, with that, that is the last of our agenda items this week. Is there any topics we have for the open floor this week? Uh, hey, this is Fabian. Um, and sorry for being late. There was a conflict on my side. And I just wanted to, to circle back to the, um, to the first topic, uh, discuss, propose the new governance model. So first, Josh, thank you very much for bringing up the PR. And um, I was wondering, what's the, was there any consensus? And I'm looking at like um, the people that are currently mentioned in the original list, like David, Vladik, Roman, Stu, what do you think about this proposal? And also Ryan, even if it's not mentioned, but also Ryan, I'm eyeing on you. What, what do you guys think about that proposal? Yeah, I can say, as, as I said before, the, the direction is definitely good. Proposal. <laughs> Anything that's missing to you, Roman? Mostly the maintainer list needs to be updated, but we discussed it already a few times. Yeah. Okay, yeah. did you? Oh, well, sorry. I was going to say, I, yeah, I agree with the proposal as well. We just need to come up with a, an action plan for the maintainers list. Yeah, okay. Yeah, One I, of the things, sorry, go ahead. No, please go. Yeah, one of the things that Josh had pointed out to us is that we are not using the, um, the Qvert maintainers list from CNCF. And that would be a great way to periodically, maybe twice a year, review who's actually really being an active maintainer of the project and updating that list. Uh, because by the way, that's something that CNCF is tracking separately from us. So we do need to keep them apprised if the list changes. Yeah. Um, one of the other important things about why you're going to have to start using that maintainers list is that we had some aliases like security at kubevert.io um, that were being directed to places in Red Hat, um, uh, which is not really good for a CNCF project. And so those aliases are going to get redirected to that maintainers list. Mm -hmm. um, so um, stuff is going to come there regardless. What's the plan to move forward to find a consensus on this PR? I, I think we, except for updating the maintainers list, I think we have, I think we have it. Okay. I, I kind of regard, you know, as the, a lot of people have commented on it already. Um, you know, more people in this meeting are welcome to comment. I don't know if you think of something later on today. Um, but, um, the, um, that was why I wanted to bring it to the community meeting so we can get kind of final approval from the community that this is uh, an okay starting governance. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, I would actually directly propose something for the maintainers list, um, because I think we have some of the existing maintainers here. So first I propose to drop some of the inactive maintainers like, um, and all of them are great, but right? it's not about them personally, but they have simply not been active. So like. Mark, Marson, Artyom, and Sebastian, all of them have not been really involved with Qbert in the last half year, and I mentioned that in PR comments. And at the same time, I would actually like to propose to include Ryan Hallisey and Marcus Sorensen as, as maintainers as well. The main reason being, like we have that separation or the proposal is separating between approvers and these maintainers. I think both Ryan and Ryan, while being at Red Hat and now being at NVIDIA, has shown interest to drive Qbert forward. And the same is true for Marcus, who's with Qbert for even longer. And so I would grant them my trust at least to say they behaved like them, right? They, they have shown, they've shown direction, they've brought input to it. So to me, they're already meeting that criteria. And therefore I would, I think it's just fair to include them in that uh, original list. Totally concur. I think that the silence is a lack of uh, uh, contention, not a. Okay. Objections from the other very old people here on the call, David Vladik, Oman. 
Uh, I was not sure regarding to Michael because he has great contributions, but his appearance is pretty sporadic. But in general, I mean, we know that they use Qubit for quite a long time and brought some inputs. Is this mainly needed for to show diversity in company wise or? Uh, I think that's also something, right? We don't, I think one goal is to really show this is not something we as Reddit want to push. And, um, but that is not my motivation to, to, to propose these additional maintainers. It's mostly um, to say they have shown, right? That they, they have shown genuine interest to push Qubit forward, right? Ryan has initiated like the, um, the ZIG scale and performance that we have now and um, Marcus, yes, Roman, he has had not had many contributions, but I think they have been around. So um, I think uh, to move this forward, I think we need to talk to them or especially Michael yeah. out of band first, because if they're on that list, there are, there are then possibly some votes to take where we need majority and so on. So they need to be available and we need to be. So it's not about saying no, but it's about saying that they need to agree to be present when needed and that they can do that. Yeah, that would be that's my fair. Yeah. take on that. Okay, I'll put a need info on them effectively mm -hmm. and see what they say. Okay, cool. I have a topic for the open floor. And that is um, looking to see if there's any interest or volunteers for somebody that would like to help moderate this meeting each week. Anywho, uh, the thoughts behind that are that, of course, with Chris uh, out for the indefinite future, um, and you know, I've I've always acting as a backup, but in his uh, wake, I have taken over the you know, kind of the primary uh, position here is the uh, meeting moderator. But first off, it'd be great to have two people doing this at least, uh, just so that I have a backup. And it would also be great to have somebody uh, who's focused technically, if you will, uh, you know, with my recent role change to being a manager, um, it, that's, you know, technically I'm, I'm not a, you know, not to overuse the word technical, but I'm not a technical contributor in that sense anymore. I'm happy to keep leading this meeting, but it would be great to have um, more uh, broad focus if anybody were interested or willing. I, I don't care um, about leading it. Like, I, <laughs> that sounded weird. I don't mind uh, helping lead anytime. It's not a big deal. I'm already here. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Is there any other topics anybody would like to raise today for the open floor? KubeCon maybe? Cube. Did we did a check-in on KubeCon if somebody got here feedback from uh, having an accepted talk? I did talk? get feedback. Uh, Ryan and I made a proposal about, um, it's gonna talk about some of the stuff we've been working on six scale and we got wait listed. So we might make it, we might not. I asked them when we would know for sure. And they said by September 1st. So maybe we get to talk about Qbert. We'll see. Good luck. That proposal was rejected. Ah. Vladek, did you have a co-presenter with you or? We, did, did you just submit it by yourself? No, that was just my by myself, and uh, I think I submitted it very at the very last moment. So. You might. I have asked. a I have oh. a theory about KubeCon submissions that uh, Red Hat employees have a very low chance of making it. If uh, yeah, if they are. Everyone has a low chance. Everyone has a low chance of making it in. Um, even this KubeCon actually had lower numbers of submissions than we've had in the past um, because, um, you know, people are confused about the whole hybrid thing. 
Um, and even so, um, seven proposals were rejected for everyone that was accepted. Um, actually, here's an important thing. If you have the draft of the proposal that you that you submitted um, and it's already has not been accepted, today is the deadline for cloud native rejects, which is an online conference that is happening right before KubeCon. Um, is generally reasonably well attended. So if you want to take that draft and submit it to cloud native rejects, um, you still have time. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat. Thanks. Um, and I'll say, by the way, for a normal KubeCon, and this is what I would expect for Europe in, in the spring, assuming that the pandemic situation doesn't get worse. Um, the uh, acceptance rate for KubeCon is one out of 15. So you don't really need to look for a reason why your talk wasn't accepted. It's the odds are that it's not going to be accepted. Do you have uh, any indication that um, there, because I, I know the CNCF, for example, throttles uh, some discussions that occur when lots and lots of people from one company try to bombard them, for example. With yeah, the that, yeah. Yeah, that happens. That tends to happen towards the the end of the um, choosing the talks. So what happens is all of the track leads, and I'm a track lead for this one. We submit our final list of recommendations. So like I was a storage track lead, and we recommended five storage submissions for the final conference, and then the chairs put all of those together and they look across it. And one of several things they look for, they have multiple criteria, but one of several things they look for is, hey, if they have that final list of recommendations, but 40% of the presenters are from one company, whether that's Red Hat or anyone else, um, then yeah, they're gonna bump some talks based on who the, pre on who the presenter works for because um, they really don't, it's bad for KubeCon overall to appear to be dominated by a single company. Sure. Okay. So um, the theory is accurate then. That's, yes. Okay. Um, and that's actually <laughs> why one of my recommendations when people from Red Hat are submitting talks is if you can get a co-presenter, um, particularly one who does not work for Red Hat, it improves your odds tremendously. Right. And that's why I asked Vladek if he had a co-presenter yeah. because I had uh, um, the NVIDIA co-presenter and then we have a chance. Yeah, and now, by the way, this I'll say, this is one of the reasons why I'm pushing, you know, why we're trying to get Kubert into incubation, because once Kubert is a CNCF incubating project, we are entitled to a maintainer session, which we are not in Sandbox. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So, um, you know, and the, um, and why I would have liked to actually get us into incubating by the end of June, which was the deadline for this KubeCon, but there were just too many things to do um, around the project to make that happen. But this will mean that if we go and buy for KubeCon spring in Europe, which is honestly the better KubeCon for us anyway, um, uh, we should be entitled to a maintainer session. But, but also consider submitting that talk to Cloud Native Rejects. Thank you. Are there any other thoughts today before we, we do have one poll request that needs attention. So if there's no objections, we can move to that. And I, Petter, is this yours? It's mine. No. Nope. <laughs> Hi. All right. Um, yeah, so this is the PR. There are two topics that uh, need attention. There is one is a design discussion that is ongoing with uh, David and Eddie. And it, uh, it went a few iterations and we need to take, and uh, I'm trying to push this forward. So we can open this, we can, we can discuss it. The last uh, comments. And uh, the second uh, topic is the fact that uh, this PR is, well, is, is stuck, I mean, I did a test there that uh, tries different path in the code that uh, is no longer working for me. 
because another uh, change that was introduced to vert handler reconciler loop that I'm trying to debug. Uh, Vladik and uh, also David tried to help me with that. And I want to hear what you guys think about it. I see that uh, both of you are here. Is there a specific angle to this PR? And also, can we post, is it in the community chat? Let me double check. Yes, uh, for, for the design for the design uh, discussion, uh, there was the, the angle is uh, where to put the lo the logic uh, for the re hot plug once the migration is failing. We're talking sure. about re hot plugging uh, SRV devices when the migration fails. So and can we get a link to this? So sure. we have yeah, put in the. This is for the discussion about uh, the logic. And there is another link. Regarding to the discussion of the logic, I no, think that- Something else for the, the problem that uh, we have with the, with the tests. So I think in general, regarding to if you retry or if you fail a migration, I think it's independent of if of the of where the code needs to reside and how it needs to react. So I think right now you have a code path where it's not picked up in the eventually loop uh, in the eventual consistent controller loop always due to the way how it is done. Um, and I think that needs to be changed. So you can just try. In the first iteration, for instance, once and just fail the migration if it fails. I don't see it. It's a thing that would block the PR as such, but it still needs to be reliable, found by the controller loop, and needs to reside at the locations where it can be propagated properly. I think I'm not understanding why this is difficult to just put in the uh, regular reconcile. So we're talking about a failed hot plug, why couldn't the sync BMI and, uh, for example, Vert Launcher see, hey, we're not doing a migration and this thing is a hot plug, let's try to re-hot plug it. It's, it's, um, this is, I mean, I found this very interesting uh, just to, I mean, the topic itself is interesting, but I don't know if we have other uh, things that are reconciling the, the the domain or the guest in this case, because hot plug and uh, of a device is very, is mutating the guest. It's like uh, a device appears inside of it or disappears. It's very, pretty drastic. And uh, usually this, this uh, workaround of unplugging and plugging it back in order to do the migration is very, very specific for the migration. And, and uh, making it more generic in the sense that you reconcile if uh, the expected devices is not there and you, or you, you, don't, you, you want to plug it back in a reconciled way. It's, it sounds good to me, but it's, it's very uh, interesting. It in it. From my point of view, it just when the migration, when you unplugged something, and the, there was a migration, it ended in a certain way. This has to be replugged back. So if yes. you have a condition um, on the VMI, for example, um, it's already know that this has to happen. So it doesn't matter if the migration uh, succeeded and you need to plug or the migration didn't succeed yeah. and you need to plug it back, you would still have this condition until it's cleared. No, it's, yeah. uh, I think. I think this is because you are looking at it at, uh, at the, you are looking at it, we, even if there is no migration and this happened, it will, you are saying it should happen, right? It's like you're saying, I'm supposed to have here two devices plugged and now I have only one, I need to plug the second one, right? This is what you're saying and it makes sense. No, the no, problem no. is that- I'm not saying this. No, so what do you say? I'm saying this in the context of a migration. Um, at the beginning of the migration, Devices are getting unplugged, um, and then you can add um, a condition or some something in the VMI status uh, that this needs to be plugged back. 
And then no, we are not. Over. We are not doing that now. Okay, so this is. I think this is what we were discussing about. Um, the, the, what David suggested, I guess. I, well, okay, so everyone. Okay, I didn't understand it this way. Well, a condition would be needed if we don't have a way to. Uh, well, detect that needs to be re hot plugged. Yeah. Yeah. If it's right. possible just for a BERT launcher to reconcile when it when it goes to the reconcile uh, function and BERT launcher to just say, hey, this thing needs to be re hot plugged because we know that it's supposed to be on the domain, then maybe you wouldn't have to have ignition. I'm not sure. The fact I think it's, it's, it's yeah. something which you want to show. That it, that I, I guess you want to show it to the users too in the status that something is not right. Sure. Yeah. They will know about it because they see that there is no, in the status, they see that there is no, they expect, like, say, three device, three, three interfaces, but they see only two. So they can know. You don't, you, you have the information, but you could add yeah. another one, yes. Oh, so we already have the information to know that it needs to be hot plugged in the VMI. No, we this information exists. So from a, the aspect of reconciling, we can always. This is what I'm saying. What you suggested to do in the VMI sync, we can always try to hot plug or make sure that the, all the devices are inside of them every time, every loop. But let's assume that it, it fails each time. And so I, I'm I'm feeling that I'm trying to change the uh, the domain and. We are doing something very that we mutates it, and we will continue failing there, or, or maybe we will plug each time different devices, not at once. While the whole operation was supposed to be very limited to the migration and not to the. Why is it limited to the migration? Now it is limited because it's a one timer request. The unplug is limited to the migration. That's the time that we would do it. But the replug or whatever. Uh, that's it's really also cool. limited to the migration, the replug. There is no place in the code that we replug a survey device. Right. We do no, it, right like Eddie right said, it's, it's one timer. We Once the the VMI is up, we will apply with the device devices that is plugged, and that's it. Well, that's what I'm saying is wrong, though, because that's a one shot deal for something that needs to be resilient. Like, we don't know what to do with that failure. Like, if, if I mean, just ignoring yeah, it. I, I don't. I don't think it's necessary right now to to retry. You can you can just try, decide to say okay, just try it once because it will anyway fail and it gives the chance for the admins to go into the VM and fix it somehow. Or you can try it with a back off or something. Uh, but I think independent of that, it needs to be at the places in the logic where it could be used, like it can be reconciled because only that way it's properly picked up everything everywhere. It can I, be. I wouldn't ignore it. Uh, I would rather it keep retrying and make lots and lots of noise than uh, yeah, that's fine, show but... one error that goes into a log and is buried <laughs> in like a... Yeah, I think we need a clear condition or a clear error statement on the VM that it's not working and that it is continuing doing that. I just mean we can talk about how often it does it with what back off or whatever. So maybe we should have... I don't know how it works in... We should maybe... Um, it's like this one, this PR is an enhancement to the existing migration. And, and I just want to raise that. I don't know how it works in OpenStack now, but in, for example, in Rev, uh, there is no even, uh, if, if the migration fails, it will not connect it back at all. So they are like, everyone is doing a different thing. So between reconciling it, uh, trying to put it back all the time and having it once, trying it once and just error it and having nothing. Uh, that's like all the options on the table. And I do think that uh, exploring the fact, I mean, currently on the target, we plug the devices in as well. So if we put it in the VMI sync, we can even remove the code on the target. We can say, well, on the target, I'm supposed to have the, these, these devices, so I would just connect them if I see they are not there. The only problem with that is that we cannot we cannot declare that the migration is over. So in a nice way. Yes. But, I, uh, 
yeah, since it's, Can since I, it, Frank, in, just for a second here, just to remind us that we are over time. So if we could, uh, I, 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 there is an active discussion here, so I won't cut it off, but uh, we do need to wrap it up soon. Uh, how about anyone that needs to leave who isn't interested in this discussion can bounce. I'd, I'd like to come to some sort of conclusion because this is not going to end. Yeah. I think the main difference between um, Rev or Overt or <clears throat> anything else is that an um, Overt, you can uh, dynamically um, attach these devices from outside. Whereas here uh, in Kubert, we cannot do this. So we need some kind of a, something on the VMI that will indicate that these devices need to be replugged. No, but we have, uh, Monica, we do have this information. This is easy because we are saying we have this information that we need to plug them. We know what's in the domain. So this information exists. We can do it. It's not. Yes, but that's not the problem. Again, just just hear me out. Um, yeah. This information may exist. I, I don't know where does it exist. I didn't. I didn't see. But uh, it, there has to be when you start the migration. You, you need to say that um, these devices has been unplugged, and then when these devices are plugged back, this um, condition or status can be cleared, and then uh, we don't need to act on this. Um, but when we do have some, this condition, it doesn't matter if the migration has been over and we need to plug it on the destination or if the migration failed and we need to replug it on the source, there will be something that on the VMI that will indicate that this operation needs to happen. Yeah. Okay, but the, the, I'm just, okay, I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying that the condition can be calculated from the existing info. We don't need to have another parameter for that. We Is need it? to have something that VMI will, will be reconciled. Yes, it, I'm saying, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying that when you, when you go over the loop, you know what, what the domain has, what the devices are, if the device is plugged or not. And you know that you need what you need to plug in. You need what devices you need. So you, this information exists. Yes. I mean, we could, we could call it like every time in the loop, and it will try to reach the end result of having all the devices that are supposed to be there plugged. I get what you're saying now. So in the reconcile loop, we have both the domain and the VMI, and we know that there's a mismatch here and that the uh, bird launcher sync, the thing that's syncing the VMI can do this comparison and say, hey, we need to re-hot plug this thing and re-hot plug it. Then, we could also, in the update status for the VMI, have a condition if we wanted to give user feedback to say, uh, we've noticed this mismatch exists, this device uh, is not plugged into the domain. And that would give um, more informational, uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily be the thing that we had to use to decide whether the hot plug occurred or not, but it would give uh, a condition the, the yeah, should be clearly seen for the right. user that this VM did, does not properly function at the moment. And that would give a reason why, too. We'd be able to say maybe even information that this didn't happen due to a failed migration. Or I'm not sure how possible that is, but uh, it gives us an opportunity to uh, explain what has occurred. Okay, so so if I understand what you're saying is that one action is in the, in the update because we see that uh, the desire is not the current. And uh, in the status is the same. If we see that we have another check in the status, and if we see they are also different there, then we can also put it in a different condition status that says that uh, explicitly to the API. So right? the condition is, and they update the stash, that's going to be an observation of the collective, like BMI, what's happening on the domain, and all that, and reporting that. Uh, this state exists, something's not hot plug. And then the actual sync, we're doing that same comparison and deciding how to act on it, yeah. Okay, so so everything, I mean, it sounds very great to me. The, the only problem that, or only question that I have over this is that unlike the current state that where everything is one, it's a one-time attempt, uh, this will will cause uh, the request side to retry it all the time and then I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure if this is good or, or bad because we don't have any, any 
anyone else doing that? I mean, any other project that uh, works with Livert, I guess. I don't know anyone that will try to do this. Yeah, the but uh, the others are not eventually consistent. They are imperative systems altogether. So I think one important thing here is that uh, retries should back off. So it's, of course, important to not overload the system, but we should retry. So oh, for instance, yeah. That, occur, that occurs naturally, just to be clear, the retry. Yeah, yeah but up. this is a good point. What you raised is a very good point. The, the only problem is that, for example, in Rev, they don't they don't even try it once. So th what happens is that the, it's up to the operator to, up to the owner of this VM to do something if they want to. And what I mean is that if you, if we use the back off here, then it will it may kill the or declare the VMI is degraded, but that may not be the, the what the user wants. So this is this is why I'm so, saying it's a so good question. So I think it's important again important to clarify a few things on the back off. First, if this hot plug can potentially block for some time, you probably you will have to trigger it asynchronously and then check on reconciles if the asynchronous job is still running. That's the first thing. The second thing, if you are in a back of loop, that normally means that uh, you will not retry until the back of period is over, except if other updates are coming in. And if the other updates are coming in, you can still process everything, which means that the VM as such can still react pretty snappy on other operations. But if no other operation is occurring at all, this operation will not bring down the system by fast retrying. Does that explain a few things? I understand the back of what I just don't understand when what I don't understand what we expect from let's let's say that it will try to to plug in uh, the devices that it could not plug in okay so we will try so what do you expect to happen after he, let's say he failed what what now it would just retry and, fail, and if it fails again it it will retry with more delay and if yeah but it will not Okay, but will it continue doing other stuff or you? Yeah, yeah sure. it should exit? continue doing other stuff. Okay. So, it, so that's what I mean. You, you, yeah, yeah. Or? Hey, so if the so if the back off fails, we don't degrade the VM, right? This is what you mean. Yeah, if other updates are coming in, they would still be processed, and you would then see, oh, there is still. Uh, and you can even start the asynchronous hot replug again. That would, if it can block, you just have to ensure that it started asynchronous so that it doesn't block the control loop. You should even have, be able to, to migrate yeah. it again. Yeah. Well, what did you say about the migration? Sorry. I, I just said that uh, even during the back off, you can. Uh, still migrate this VM again. Interesting. Yes. You should you should block if uh, this is the case because you don't have. Uh, I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. So so how I would expect that this works is that in the con maybe in the controller loop or wherever is a good place in the I mean in the controller flow but I don't I'm not talking about the explicit file here where to put it. I would expect that uh, you're starting the hot block process, but not waiting for it to succeed and that you get after uh, uh, th that you have an asynchronous information channel, which for instance, goes into the domain notifier where you can see that it succeeded or not, and then you will retry it the next time. Um, so I, I would avoid that, the control, that you do in the controller loop a call where you wait for the result and determine based on it if it fails or not. If it can block, I don't know. And 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 based on what you are saying, we should put a back off on that operation as well. So is it? Do I understand correctly? Yeah. On this specific operation of hot plugging it back. Yeah. Okay. And and what happens if I mean, you have a back off and you want it to be to, to reach a maximum time, or you want it to give up at some point? I, it will. It should reach a maximum time, and then retry okay, with that, the maximum time. Okay. So and okay and and if uh, let's let's uh, and if if we implement this one, 
I mean, this means that this PR needs to be hold or just cancel. And we need to move the existing code of the migration to change it. Because on the target, we do the same thing. We, we plug it in. So what you are saying is that we can, we can do it like in a, that's why, in a software. That, that's why I suggested to put something in the VMI status so that on the destination, you will know that you need to plug that. No, we know. We will know that we need to plug that. But the question is, should we continue trying? So you are saying that, yes, on the target, we also need to retry, right? Yes. I yeah, think so. keep, keep trying. Um, yeah. I mean, we don't really, we don't have a better option than to try to be eventually consistent with this. I mean, what would you, um, if you want to offload, let's say, for example, the hot plug fails and we say, all right, this is what the admin uh, needs to do to restore um, this this virtual machine. What would that thing be? What would they have you to can, do? You can limit it to one or X calls and you have a condition on the VM where it says this device could not be hot plugged and then the admin can go in and try to fix it. It's How? That's the thing. Like what would they, what would be the instructions? Can, well, it's, it's guest side. So it's, it's yeah, already it's on, on, so it's already on the domain again, but something on the guest mount is probably not reacting properly, right? Or I thought it was on the host side that the hot plug failed. No, in the, if it's on the host side, I think that if it's on the host side problem, then the pod, the target pod will not even come up. So I don't think, I mean, it, if in the source, in the source, uh, you, it's, you already have the device. And I think it's only a problem in the domain my opinion because sure the it's device the, itself was there that's the hope i'm saying that it's a failure to apply the change to the domain is that accurate yeah. it's, it's yeah. not something that's happening okay, yeah. internally within the guest it's yeah. a failure yeah. to apply something to the domain okay. so how would somebody so, yeah. fix that then, yeah then we just yeah you're right we can just retry there's nobody there's no yeah. way to fix it practically yeah. unless we say uh exec into this pod execute this verse command by mutating uh, your domain XML, and then you're competing with uh, the mutations coming from the uh, first launch. Maybe it works. I don't know. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Which yeah, is it, 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 it's not really difficult. Um, you you need to know a lot of things like uh, PCI addresses and stuff. And, uh, yeah. So just well, retrying. No. It's really the only option. Yeah, retrying is one option. The other option is to say that if it fit. I mean, let's say that some uh, the, someone comes now and tells you, okay, if it failed once, there is no chance it will work. I don't know why, but let's say Fail that someone is telling, yes, you no will have recovery. to fail it and that's it, you finish. So, well, yeah. there, are, the there are always reasons why it can succeed later on. I mean, we have a lot of cases where it's unlikely that it will resolve itself, but this is how a model works. And there are always cases where it can resolve. Like there can be issues uh, the device plugins are providing a device, but it gets ready too late or whatever. We have we haven't had cases like this in different areas. I'm not no, saying that failing the VMI is the, the, the right thing to do. Uh, that one some action has to be taken. Like we can't ignore it. So either continue to retry the hot plug, or if somebody has an argument for why that would never succeed all the time, then failing the VMI would be the correct thing to do not leaving it in the state that can't be recovered, I guess. I mean, or, or reporting that it's an unrecoverable state. I, I have no idea that it can't be, it can't be ignored. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. But, but keep in mind, this is uh, something only to the guest itself. There are many cases that we need to, to do stuff again and again, and try to and retry and uh, try a different way how to fix it. It's part of the reconciler for the VMI object. This is like taking a device and connecting to the VM itself. I don't think it's something, for me, it's, it's you know, at first glance, it sounds it sound like something that you don't want to repeat again and again. This is why I'm trying to understand the, what you, the, your approach. We oh, maybe retry that... everything. We retry hot plug, we retry unhot plug uh, of volumes. So why wouldn't we do the same with PCI devices? Well, it's interesting. Like, yes. I, I, do we have any other case where uh, where we mutate the the domain while everything is running? So oh, the the example is uh, just the, the the volumes. 
Uh, pods, possibly. Uh, no, no. I mean the domain, the the domain itself, the guest. It's it, the guest is running now, right? So this we need to change right now. Mostly the only option, but I mean it's it, it doesn't really mean much if it's on the domain XML where you do the change or on something else. No, it, I mean in in terms of uh, affecting the guest. But okay. For now, th we there's the going to be a network hot plug at some point. I would expect. And we use the guest agent as well to do stuff. It's a time. Um, yeah, uh, Edward, is there a reason why you think that when it's about the domain XML that it should not be retried, but in other cases, yes? Uh, no, it's not about the domain XML. I'm, I'm saying because this is like uh, not just domain XML can change live virt uh, configuration even on the host side or the pod side. But this one is uh, intrusive in terms of the guest because let's say I'm just giving you an example, okay? Let's say you have 10. 10 devices and you start uh, hot plugging. So it connect the first one, then it will fail the others. Then the second reconcile will connect the second. It, it's like uh, it's like intrusive in the sense of the guest. Not uh, I'm not talking about the- Yeah, you mean when you're entering the guest and you run the mask or something, you will see that yeah. there is something, maybe the kernel crashed or- yes. it's Exactly, it's like you take uh, yeah, a, I mean, a printer and <laughs> keeps contacting it to your laptop. Something is yeah. happening. Okay, I mean, that's fine. I mean, you uh, someone tried to migrate with that device and of course expect that it's still working. I, I mean, or let me rephrase it. The person is not even trying to migrate it for whatever reason that we have migrated because we don't have users which do migrations. So migrations is not something which users do. So they have a VM which is perf running perfectly fine. It has the SRO devices and a few other host devices it, and it works great, the application on it is doing whatever it needs to doing, and then you do a migration, and then it's just not working anymore. I would expect that we try to bring it back to the state where it is working. It's like if we have a, a what's comparable if if store if there is a storage outage, the domain goes in post, and we are retrying bringing it out of post, and then the storage comes back, it's unpost again. Okay, so. So I guess I'm, 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 I was pretty sure convinced that the, this, it will be an interesting action to take, but I was not convinced if this is like what we want to do immediately now. So let me summarize and ask, do we want to reach the, the end result as you described now to with the reconcile also on the target? Or do we, are, or are we okay first to try to recover it one timer in the, in the migration source? Which or, or or we should just not do that and just aim to the to the end goal here. The, I, I would say that if we're making a change, we need to make it like a global or overall change our behavior. Okay. Okay. Other things though. <laughs> we so... we trust in you. Can, can, can we conclude? I'm, I'm hearing you very, very, uh, how to say it? The, the sound is very weak. Can you, can you conclude it for me, please? Yes, we say, uh, I think it was said that everyone here prefers that uh, we'll not do this intermediate step of one time which, uh, reconnecting back the devices, which will solve it at uh, a reconcile level and hopefully we'll do it in uh, also for the target uh, the same. So that's it. So basically, need to change how this uh, SRV migration works. Not only on the target, more or less it's on the target, and and uh, and when it fails, we just need to trust the reconcile. Okay. So, okay, okay, I got you. And uh, what about the, the problems that I saw on the, with the expectations and, the, and that stuff? So isn't Your this, if I change most... it? Sorry. Oh, very good. I, I'm just curious, if we are changing the approach right now, it is going to affect um, this expectation set? I don't know, I didn't try it. <laughs> 
I didn't try to, to move the logic to the reconciler loop and see how it goes. So what I think should happen here is if a migration fails or if a migration succeeds, there should be one more reconcile loop that either occurs on the source or the destination, which will call the hot plug, which would cause the hot plug. The problem that you're having with the BMI expectations is strange. To, I don't really understand it yet. It looked to me like the logic is in a place which does not feed back into the, into the reconcile loop. So it may have worked by accident before you did your, your optimization, David, that you, 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 you know, you did the change that, yeah. that you're waiting for the VM update status to come in again before you do the reconcile. And uh, I think that led in the led before you changed to the situation that the reconcile loop was just triggered so often anyway that it just by accident also picked up the change. But now there is just no change which gets observed because the reconcile loop is not triggered anymore. Oh, but uh, but wait, this is this is interesting because I think the what happens is that if you try, huh, maybe if you fail. No, sorry. If you if you let's say the there is a failure of the migration, and then in this case, his case was that he tries to connect the devices. The devices got connected, right? This will trigger in the background uh, domain the domain to send uh, an event of uh, device connected, which is picked up by the listener. I don't remember. And then the event will be sent to the to the virt handler, and it's supposed to handle it. This is because this is why it's strange. It's supposed to be catched somehow. Right? Yes, because there is no other handler. Exactly. No. Something is stuck. It's like wait for itself to to handle the VM, the, the update and remove the expectation, but it won't happen. No, I'm, I'm asking. I'm asking Roman because he said he thinks well, he, it's not supposed yeah, to close uh, the. I, I don't see in the PR the host. Yeah, the host hot plug host devices function what it's doing i just have to look it up in the search code it it is just uh, consider that uh, it it co connects the devices back to the domain and that succeeds because that's known it succeeds so the fact that it was plugged in is supposed to be uh, what do you call it uh, the event should should go over everywhere this is right it's it's theoretically i mean so what, what david did yeah, I mean, I don't know what, I mean, you debugged it a little bit already. So you're seeing that the event is coming in and that, uh, at that. I, said, uh, I have the insights. <laughs> I, have, I, I can even share the logs. What basically what I'm seeing is that the, the initial migration metadata does reflect on the VMI. Once uh, at the attributes completed and failed are added to the migration metadata, they are not they are not reflected back to the VMI. So it means that at this point, the events are not handled anymore. But keep in mind that the migration metadata keeps updating it from this point and further. Yeah, but you said the controller loop is not triggered, so that means that the domain or the no, the, the, the notify changes are not coming in, right? It does it does trigger. But the expectation, but it's it's not continue to the VMI update uh, function because of the expectations. It yeah, checks yeah, that the, uh, it should happen again. But the expectations, well, there are two ways how the expectations can uh, time out. One is to get an actual update on the status, then it should be immediately timed out, and the and the sync should happen. And the other way, there is a timeout of a few minutes, and then it would con on the next, on the next notify event or whatever, it would work again. But um, that's really curious to me that it's not. So you're saying that the expectation isn't satisfied, so the thing exactly. doesn't happen. Now, if the expectation isn't satisfied, then it should be satisfied shortly after because. If for it to yeah. not be satisfied then means that we made an update to the VMI. And we're only going to make an update if we're actually writing a change to the VMI. Therefore, so we should be able to observe 
yeah. that that occurred. Do you lose on the domain side that information from the failed thing? Like you get you you would get an update in this case that it got hot plugged, uh, but you're not processing it, and then the next domain notify event this information is not sent again. I want evidence that the second domain notification isn't occurring immediately after yeah. that uh, yeah. unsatisfied. If you can point that out, then we have a bug. But wait, um, keep more, in more mind. Call. You need to work with, deb uh, need to debug more. This is what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, I couldn't find any more debugging that I, I could do. What I did basically is taking the test that keeps failing which is uh, where I inject uh, a failure while the migration setup. So it should fail immediately and replug the, the, the device. Everything works as I expect, other than the, the migration metadata won't to propagate. So this you know problem. that the, satisfy, the, you know the expectation not. is not satisfied. So you've done some sort of debugging to see that the expectation here uh, returns early because it's not satisfied. Then do some more debugging to maybe put a timestamp on when it actually does make it past that. And if you can see that it wasn't satisfied at this timestamp and it immediately gets executed like sub seconds after, or yeah, after that, then we know that the expectations are working like we want them, but something else is preventing us from doing the action. Um, so I should, so. I'm trying okay, to... so we will we will try to work on. At some this. point, David, at some point, or told me that he removed the patients, and it did work. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's curious. Uh, yes, so if you don't set expectation, everything just works. Yeah, one reason for that can be that you are losing that information from the notifier perspective. So that's what I was trying to get at. If, yeah. if we see that expectation is doing what we want it to do, meaning it's blocking the execution of that loop, but then very quickly, right after that, executing it again, then that means that maybe information's lost, like Roman pointed out, maybe something else is occurring that isn't doing the thing that we want to do. And, and it's important that we figure that out because there's no guarantees that that won't happen anyway. We might have just gotten lucky that when we remove the expectation, things happen to fall within a timing threshold that for accurate. instance, you can, you, for instance, you can just print the domain information you get in the notifier callback, and it, and it would be interesting then to see there if uh, you will. So, so the notifier is called anyway independent of expectation. So you will always get the state which you got from the launch ascent, and so you can can just print what is going in there, and it will, will then be interesting to see if you're losing that information in the sense that you first see okay the hot plug failed, and then there is another domain notifier event coming in with the aggregated state, but there are this information that it feels is lost. From what I saw until now, there is no data loss. Uh, I, I, some, some, someone, in, someone in the game adding, the, adding an expectation or it just don't, won't handle. But I checked what you said, there is no data loss. And I also wanted to mention that from what I saw, uh, I, say, uh, I, you know, when I, when I debugged it, I saw that the VM controller gets a drastically lower amount of events to handle. For example, on that test, it uh, with ex expectations, it uh, reconciled like 17 events. And when I tried to stop the adding ex expectations, it's uh, it's reconciled like 35 events. Yeah, but that's the purpose of the PR to not do the, to, to only reconcile when it makes sense. Like before that PR, uh, we were not waiting that the VM status update was pro propagated back. So you could have five domain events in the meantime, and they were all trying to update the VM status again, which of course failed because we didn't even get the latest status back. So David added to the expectator that we're waiting for that. But the key is that the expectator is, is only delaying the, the sync loop until that update is coming in. And once this update is there, it takes the latest VM spec it got and the latest notifier spec, which it got into the controller loop. And you should still see it there. 
So everything okay. just a question. This means that everything is queued. That there is a, the queue is filling up with the events. There is no queue. There, uh, I mean, there is a work queue, but um, but this works with a cache in the backend. So based on the key, like namespace name or so, okay. it has a, a single spot which gets overwritten with with the latest date all the time. So there is no queue filling up. Yeah. Okay. That's the regular uh, pattern to. Yes, there is a, an informer uh, on the background. Yeah, so there are two informers. There's a VM informer and the domain. And okay, well, we don't, you don't have, I don't think we, I mean, based on the information I'm hearing here is that there is no other way just to continue debugging it until it's clear. It, it just, even if we don't use this uh, solution. What, what I was not sure problem. about is maybe, the, the, can it be that maybe the hot plug in the guest looked right, but that the command still somehow fails? So that you, for instance, what, what happens if you do the if you do the hot plug, but uh, uh, and but it fails? Is then there a change on the domain XML? Wait, wait, can you say it again? What happens when there is a hot plug? And then so what? you do a hot plug in this asynchronous part where you do it right now. And is that always triggering an event also when the hot plug fails? Or is there also in this, uh, how is it called, host hot plug device function? I don't see it in the PI what it is doing, but. I don't think it returns it... an error. And this error is reported, but then ignored. Yes, right? because we don't have ex actually something what that we can. If this returns an error, yeah. Have I have a guarantee that I see on the domain XML an update regarding to this? Um, I, from what I uh, from what I saw until now, uh, there shouldn't be a problem. Even if uh, if a VM is uh, failed to to hot block a device, the XML is is updated as usual and uh, it should work. Right, right, it's like, this is two different things, I think. One is, if there is a success, then yeah. the domain is, the domain XML is updated with the device that you plugged in. If there is a failure, then, but not only that, not only the domain is updated, you, it's also executing, you will get an event of, that says device plugged or something, I don't remember, attached. So it's, it sends an event that we register to that, uh, our listeners are the, the event, I don't remember what's the name, it registered too, so we, it should trigger an event of the domain change just because of that, not regarding the domain XML change. And, uh, but the domain XML will change obviously. If there is a failure, I don't think we'll get any, okay. any event and not, and we'll, okay, not, so you, we'll not see the yeah, XML okay, that, change. That's just related to it. That's not, I, I was just thinking maybe about cases where it looks like it is succeeding, but it is not really, and they may miss because of that something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was just a thought. I think, yeah. Yeah, I think, it, I think what all from all testers was that uh, he says that everything is connected. I mean, the tests show that everything is fine. The, what is not fine is that uh, that, that, uh, expect, that thing was not updated. That status was not updated. Yes, even the XML of the domain is, is updated as, as you would expect. After the plug and that plug and then again. Yeah, I would still, even if you are pretty confident, I would still print the domain XML specifications out again and try to ensure that you really see the, the succeeded or failed attempt in the latest cache state first. And that you also yeah. see, that you clearly see that the expectation is never uh, fulfilled, like just printing timestamps or so when it gets fulfilled, something like this. Wait, so you say to print the domain XML when it yeah, generates? From, from, the, from the notify informer, I would just print always when an update gets in there, what you see there, just to ensure that you really always keep the information which you need. And on the expectation side, I would print times table of messages, whatever, to prove that it either gets always cleared or not cleared and go from there again. Uh, I think we can discuss it now there again and again, it still is about debugging that more. 
Yes, you summarize okay, this one. Okay, I will do that and uh, share the logs on the, on the Slack channel. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Sorry for uh, killing the, your time with this. But, uh, the first uh, discussion was really good in my opinion. We can go forward now.